Shalom, this is Reverend John Ferret, and we are continuing with our study, The Gospel According to Moses, the book of Exodus. And we're at podcast 47, and we're breaking it down into a number of lessons. We're in lesson 6 right now, and this lesson is going to be focusing on Exodus chapter 20, verses 4, 5, and 6. And again, once again, we study Aseret Mitzvaot, the Ten Commandments, in context with Aseret HaDevarim, the Ten Words or the Ten Statements, or in other words, the Ten Commandments in their context in verses 1 through 17 of Exodus chapter 20. So let's take a look at verses 4, 5, and 6 from the New American Standard. You shall not make for yourselves an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water underneath the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. Again, we recall in previous lessons that there are three different lists of the Ten Commandments. The Jewish list, the Catholic list, and the Protestant list. Now, only the Protestant list uses verse 4. Verse 4 says, You shall not make for yourselves an idol or any likeness of what is heaven, uh, what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath the water. Only the Protestant version uses this verse, and it's the second commandment for the Protestants. The Jewish list and the Catholic list do not have this statement. So, if we were studying the Ten Commandments exclusively, if we were only studying the Protestant list, or if we were Catholic, just studying the Catholic list, or if we're Jewish, and we're studying just the Jewish list, we're going to miss all of the other words that are in verses 4, 5, and 6. This is God's word. This is part of Aseret HaDevarim, the very words of God. Remember, in the past lessons we learned that in Hebrew, in the original Hebrew, there is no te- there are no Ten Commandments. There is no phrase, Aseret Mitzvahot. And that's the Hebrew for Ten Commandments. That was invented by the church back in the 1500s. We've already covered that. It was a total mistranslation. The Hebrew is Ten Statements, Aseret HaDevarim. In other words, verses 1 through 17 of chapter 20. And once again, if we're just studying the Ten Commandments, we miss so much because we're not taking those Ten Commandments and putting them back into their textual context. So again, let's start taking this apart and again focusing in on verse 4. You shall not make for yourselves an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. Now with regards to the Hebrew in verse 4, you shall not make for yourselves an idol. The Hebrew word there is pesel. And the Strong's number is H6459, and Pesel means an idol, a carved image, or a sculptured image. Uh, Carved or sculptured, the one English word that's used is graven. It's not used here in the New American Standard, but maybe in your version it'll say a graven image. All that means is something that's carved or sculptured. So in other words, it's a man-made image. And again, We go to Dennis Prager's commentary, The Rational Bible on the Book of Exodus, and we take a look at his comments with regards specifically to something man-made, something that's carved, something that you can see. And as Prager comments, He says it seems as if the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, is seemingly more suspicious of the eye than of the ear. 
and rightly so. People are often led to sin when something glittering catches their eye or when they are seduced by someone who is irresistibly attractive to the eye. This commandment reflects this understanding that for all of our senses, the eye has the greatest power to lead us astray. In Numbers 15.39, when translated literally, it enjoins the people, do not follow your hearts and your eyes after which you prostitute yourself. Ashir chatem zonim achereihem. Do not follow your hearts and eyes after which you prostitute yourselves. Now, in those verses, back in Numbers 15, and I'm going to go through 37 through 40, and actually read all of them because I think it's very important. Dennis Prager doesn't bring it up uh, in his commentary, but I want to go back because there's something important to see here. This is the ending of the Shema, a set of verses that religious Jewish people even today say twice a day, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone, starts in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. And this is the ending of that, starting basically in Numbers 15, verse 37. Then the Lord also spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and tell them that they shall make for themselves tassels on the corners of their garments, throughout their generations, and that they shall put on the tassel of each corner of court of blue. Let me just stop there real quick. Jesus wore the tassels. The Hebrew word there is tzitziot for the tassels that uh, the Jewish religious men of those days wore on the four corners of their garments. And even today, a prayer shawl that Jewish men would use sometimes in prayer has those four tassels each on the corner of the prayer shawl. The talit. So continuing, it shall be a tassel for you to look at and remember all the commandments of the Lord so as to do them and not follow after your own heart and your own eyes after which you play the harlot, so that you may remember to do all of my commandments and be holy unto your God. This is huge. This is related to the tassels. And so I want to go a little bit deeper than Dennis Prager does because for a Jewish man, who's wearing these tassels, he's realizing, or seemingly, God is trying to help him realize that his mind and his eyes are going to be two central ways that he could be led astray. And on top of that, this seems to relate to Jesus. On the Sermon on the Mount, you'll remember in Matthew chapter 5, starting in about verse 29, Jesus says, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. And so indeed, Jesus seems to be even verifying that one way we can be led astray is definitely the eye. If you go to the JPS Torah commentary for the Exodus, written by the amazing Jewish scholar Nahum Sarna, he also suggests that indeed the visual the visual is even more dangerous than hearing. So it seems as if God is trying to tell us that we are more easily led into sin by our eyes than what we hear. Now, for the Hebrews coming out of Egypt, this is very relevant. Again, remember they have assimilated into the Egyptian culture. We covered that in earlier lessons in this specific set of lessons on the Ten Commandments, the specific set of lessons here on uh, Exodus 20. So they took on the gods of Egypt and the gods were seen. They were carved images. They were sculpted images. They were graven images. The gods were connected to animals as well. Amun-Ra was the ram and then the ostrich and the snake and the alligator, the bull. Egyptian gods were nature gods and can be seen. Egyptian gods themselves, their creator gods, Atum or Ptah or Kanum, they were created out of nature, but not Yahweh, not the Lord, not our God, not the unique God. In Genesis 1, verse 1, the heavens and earth were created by God. He's outside of space and time. 
He created nature. Genesis 1.1 is specifically, and right definitely, against the Egyptian worldview. Their gods came out of nature. For more on this, by the way, you can check the lesson called Against the Gods, Episode 1. And you can find this at the website. Go to the website, www.lightofmenorah.org. And remember, menorah is spelled M-E-N-O-R-A-H. Light of Menorah, treated as one word, dot org. You'll see the YouTube icon on the right-hand side. If you click on that, you'll be taken to the Light of Menorah um, channel, video channel, and look for the word playlist. If you click on playlist, you should be able to find the lessons on Genesis. And if you click on the lessons on Genesis, you can go into the playlist and you'll find Against the Gods, episode 1. And you can go into depth that indeed Genesis 1-1 attacks the Egyptian worldview. It attacks it 180 degrees, directly opposing that worldview of the Egyptians. In other words, it's a polemic against Egypt. So you guys, there's so much here. It adds so much to our understanding of the Ten Commandments. It, it, this shows clearly that we're not just to study the Ten Commandments as, the, as, as they are. No way. We need to put them back in their textual context and histor- historical context. Remember, the Hebrews coming out of Egypt were the first ones that heard these words. And for them, just like we talked about it right now, this not making a graven image, a sculptured image, or a carved image, th- that's exactly what they experienced in Egypt. And so, indeed, even the historical context is very important to understand the Ten Commandments. And then we read John chapter 1, verse 1. And in John chapter 1, verse 1, we read, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We go down to verse 14 of John chapter 1, and it said, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory. Glory is the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now the reason why I bring this up, as related to what we're reading right now in Exodus chapter 20, if we take these two verses together, John 1.1 1, 1 and John 1.14, the Word was there in the beginning, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and the Word became flesh. So in Christianity, for us, God becomes a man. He can be seen, he can be related to, he can be lived with. We say Jesus is God. You can go to Acts chapter 20, verse 28, and Paul is talking to the elders of the Messianic congregation of Ephesus. They're in Miletus at the time. And he says in verse 28 that God is the one, God is the one that purchased the church with his blood. He doesn't use the name Jesus. He said God did it. He doesn't say that Jesus did it. In other words, what's Paul saying? Paul is saying right there in Acts 20, verse 28, that Jesus is God. Now in Judaism, this idea of a man-God, Jesus, this goes directly against their fundamental doctrines in Judaism. The incorporality of God. This basically means that God is not physical and never can be physical. The great Maimonides in the 12th century, he developed 13 principles of Judaism. The 13 basic tenets of the faith of Judaism. And one of them is God is totally and only spiritual. He never becomes physical. He's beyond nature, beyond space and time. 
in, like in Genesis 1.1. Indeed, God created the heavens and the earth. He, he definitely is beyond space and time. But you know what's very interesting? Is Maimonides' view that he's put down in the 13 principles of Judaism is only his opinion. It's only his view that Jesus is not God or that God cannot become a man or take on a physical appearance is not in the Bible. So, Exodus chapter 20, verse 4, has some serious ramifications for us as Christians in our wish to tell the Jews about Jesus, that Jesus is the Savior. He is the, the expected Messiah, the Christ, as we say in English, and that Jesus is God. You guys, if you think about this for a moment, the barrier is high. Jews say they stand upon the very words of God. And their rabbis stand upon the very words as, uh, words of God. So do we. Now what? Well, the first thing I'd ask you to do is consider this. To purchase the audio lessons called One God and One Lord, the Shema, and the Divinity of Jesus. These were done by a scholar, just another amazing scholar that has proven credibility. His name is Dwight Pryor. He's now with Walks with the Lord. You can get his four-part audio series at www.jcstudies, Jesus Christ Studies, jcstudies.store www.jcstudies, all one word, dot store. I have these eight lessons, and I mean they are fantastic. He really goes in to show that deed, indeed in the New Testament, it is so clear that the early believers, that the, the, those first disciples, they believed that Jesus was God. And it's an amazing, amazing study. I know that for many of you, you would find this purchase so worthwhile. Because one of the things that I re we really need to do as Christians is to be able to help somebody see that Jesus is God. I'm not talking about an arguing for the Trinity. That, that you can do. But is Jesus God? We say he is. How do you prove it? So it's important. I really believe that uh, you will find this audio series of Dwight Pryor extraordinarily amazing and very useful. Dennis Prager also comments on this uh, in his commentary on Exodus. And he says he is a religious Jew and he talks about Maimonides' 13 principles. He talks about the fact that Jews do not believe at all that God can become man or uh, be, uh, leave his spiritual uh, existence and, and attain some sort of a physical presence. But he says this, Of course, Christianity later held that God appeared in human form. From a Jewish perspective, this compromised the doctrine of an, an incorporeal God. But this unquestionably enabled many people to more easily relate to divine. And by do so, so doing, Christianity played a seminal role in the bringing knowledge of the Torah and God to the world. Maimonides, who had profound disagreements with Christian theology, wrote, It was through Christianity that the Torah, the Messianic hope, and the commandments have become familiar topics of conversation among the inhabitants of the Far Isles and many peoples. Maimonides, that great Jewish scholar, says if it wasn't for the Christians, the world would not know the Torah. The world would not know the Old Testament. And for us, we remember Jesus' words. All scripture testifies of me, he says in John ch chapter 5, verse 39. And the only scripture they had was the Old Testament. And for us to see Jesus in the Old Testament, in Torah, 
this is exactly one of the goals of this entire series. So indeed, one thing about the debate between Judaism and Christianity, it's because of Maimonides Maimonides listing the 13 attributes of Judaism, and one of them is that God can never attain uh, some sort of a physical existence or a physical uh, form. In other words, he can't become man. We say he can. And again, I find it very interesting that nowhere in the Bible does it say that God cannot become a man. I remember an event in Abraham's life. I bet you do too. It's right after the first circumcision. It's in Genesis chapter 18. And we read this. Now the Lord appeared to him. Now, let me just stop there. Right here in Genesis chapter 18, verse 1, it says, Now the Lord, all caps, the word Lord is in all capital letters, which means in the original Hebrew is God's name, yod Hey vav Hey, the Tetragrammaton. And many of you already know that I pronounce it Yahweh. Now Yahweh appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre while he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day. When he lifted up his eyes and looked, behold, three men were standing opposite him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed, bowed himself low to the earth. The words there, three men, in Hebrew is shelosha anashim. Shelosha anashim means three men. That's the exact precise phrase. No doubt about it. But if you go into rabbinic commentary, especially orthodox rabbinic commentary, they basically say, oh no, God didn't mean it that. Um, it was an angel just like the other two. But the Bible doesn't say that. It says the Lord appeared to him as a man. These are the very words of God. And they say that's not what the very words of God meant. They're taking away their clear meaning and putting their own meaning. They can't, God can't become a man. And on top of that, it's got to be an angel. It's got to be an angel that's representing God. Yet we have three men who are manifestations of the spiritual messengers. And as you study Genesis 18 carefully, it is quite clear that one of the men, a manifestation of the spiritual being of God himself, was God himself. God manifested himself to Abraham as a man. Of course the rabbis disagree. They offer a solution, and it's their own opinion. Probably likely after the temple was destroyed, when all of a sudden Judaism was being challenged by Messianic Christians, Messianic Jewish Christians, those who were practicing Judaism, but said that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Savior. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is God. So the rabbis can't admit that, that God can manifest himself physically at all. If so, this opens up a door to the claims of the Messianic Jews of the first century, those first Christians. If they do this, they open up the door with the possibility that they were wrong about Jesus. Maimonides said he was a man. The very words of God said, God became a man. Very intriguing difference of opinion. I was part of a messianic congregation a number of years ago. A number of years ago. And one of the things that I began to see was these Gentiles who were practicing Messianic Judaism, and I had no problem with that whatsoever, it's just like the first century. But I began to see that they agreed with Maimonides and the 13 principles of Judaism. And they claimed that Jesus was not God that he never stated he was God, and the Bible doesn't say it. And so 
in a sense, they would not claim that Jesus is God because the Bible didn't say it. I, after that, I walked out because I'm a Bible historian. And as a Bible historian, with all the things that I studied, it's very clear to me, especially from the lessons of Dwight Pryor that I just mentioned, that indeed the New Testament and those first believers, those first disciples, Paul, all believed that Jesus was God. It's right there in front of us. And like we read in John chapter 1, verse 1, and John chapter 1, verse 14, the Word was with God at the beginning, the Word was God, and the Word became flesh. I, as, far as, as, far as, as far as I'm concerned, you guys, I stake my life on this. I know we're going to see God. We're going to see Jesus. He's going to return as He promised, and we're going to see Him. We're going to see Jesus now with this heavenly body. So let's continue on as we go to Exodus chapter 20, verse 5. And it said, You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and on the, th uh, on the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. Just a point being, it says here in my New American Standard not to worship them or serve them. Uh, and again, in other translations, you might have, you shall not bow down to them or serve them. And again, whether you have the King James, the ESV, NIV, or whatever, but in the New American Standard, it says not to worship them or serve them. Now, regardless of the translation you have, the word worship, as we know it, is not in the Bible, not in the original Hebrew or the Greek. Oh, in the English, yes, but in the original, no. Now, many today say worship of God is singing, it's lifting hands, it's praying. You'll hear about worship teams, you'll hear about the worship leader. Now, the, worship, the word worship is Old English, it's not in the Bible, was first used in about 1300 A.D. And the word worship from the Old English means an act of honoring God. Now, don't get me wrong. If you're singing today, you would say, well, yeah, that's an act of honoring God. So we're worshiping. How else can you honor God? By praying, by lifting hands. So I get that. But what we need to see is this word worship, even with its original definition back in the Old English was chosen to translate two Hebrew words. So, in Exodus 20, verse 5, the Hebrew word it translates is shaka. Strong's number H7812, and shaka basically means to bow down, to stoop down, to prostrate yourself down like bowing or prostrating yourself before a king. So that's one of the Hebrew words. If you go to Exodus 12.31, in Exodus 12.31, we read, well, let me find it here. Then he called for Moses and Aaron at night and said, Rise up, get out from among my people, both you and the sons of Israel, and go worship the Lord as you have said. Now that's Pharaoh talking to Aaron and Moses. And he's saying, Get out of here and go worship the Lord. Now if you take a look at the Hebrew, the Hebrew there is not Shaka. The Hebrew is Ebed. And the Strong's number is H5647. And Ebed means to be a servant or to serve. So this gets interesting because the translators are get really confusing us. What is it? In, in chapter 20, verse 5, the word worship is used to translate shaka, which is bow down or prostrate yourself before. But they also use the word worship in Exodus chapter 12, verse 31, which means to serve. Now I can see where the translators are coming from because bowing down, prostrating yourself, serving the Lord are all an act of honoring God. But 
guys, we've got two different words going on here in the Hebrew. Bow down, prostrate yourself, or the other word, evad, which is to serve. So which is it, you guys? Bow down or serve? If worship means to bow down... Now, if it means that the word worship translates shaka, bow down, and also eved, serve, then why didn't they do this in Exodus chapter 20, verse 5? Now, in the New American Standard, it says this, you shall not worship them or serve them. The word eved is there and shaka. So therefore, if the word worship is to translate both of those Hebrew words, Exodus chapter 20, verse 5 should be, you shall not worship them or worship them. <laughs> so why didn't they do that? Then you can go to Exodus chapter 4, verse 23, and here's God talking to Moses, and he said, tell Pharaoh to let my people come, to let my people go so that they can come and serve me. Why didn't the translators there use the word worship? Point being, you guys, it's always best to stay with the original languages. The word worship is a classic example of why. So again, that key is we stay in the original Hebrew and we get the very precise meaning. We are not to bow down or prostrate ourselves before these statues before these graven images, be, before these sculptured images, nor are we to serve them or to become the servant of them. Now, one of the reasons why is that God is a jealous God. He's jealous. Why would he be jealous of a sculptured image or a, a carved image? They're not gods. God even says that in his Bible. There are no other gods. And normal, je normally, when we take a look at jealousy, we think about the situation where there's a young man, he's dating this one girl, and he's really in love with her, and all of a sudden she gets interest in, a, in another guy. This guy, the first guy, really gets jealous, and he gets feelings of anger, frustration, um, negative feelings, and perhaps dislike and even hate of that other guy. And th this th does not jive with the God that we believe in. God so loved the world that he's sent his only son into, into the world to save the world. And God says there's no other God, so how can he be jealous? Now that's the normal way. Even the rabbis would say it's, an, it's a negative human trait. Now the Hebrew word that we're dealing with there is kana, H7067. And a Hebrew word always comes from its base root. And the base root word, from where it comes from, it's like a tree, and this is the base of the tree. That base root gives us the conceptual meaning, the, the picture of the, the entire concept of the meaning here. So the word we're dealing with in the original Hebrew is kana, H7067, but it comes from its root, Kana. Notice the difference? Kana? Kana. Kana is the base root, and it basically has a picture of being red. And so, indeed, when we take a look at uh, Kana, not Kana, but Kana, there it is. Kana basically has a positive and a negative meaning. The negative meaning is jealous, jealous or envious, and the, and the positive meaning is zealous, passionate. It makes more sense that God's canna that we're dealing with in this verse is based upon a zealous love for his people, a passionate love for his people, not jealousy. He is zealous for his people. Jealousy makes no sense. I'll give you an example. There's a loving mom. And she has her two-year-old son, and she sees her two-year-old son getting near the stove, and on the stove there's a pot that's cooking, and the burner is on. Now, she is zealous for her boy. She loves her son. 
she runs over and slaps his hand because he's reaching up to touch the pot and he's going to... She slaps him for the simple reason preventing him from getting his hand burned. She loves him. She's zealous. She'll do... She's got to do something to stop him. This is our Father. This is our God. This is Yahweh. He's zealous for his treasured special possession. He is zealous for his chosen people. And it reminds me of John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he wants all to be saved. So he provides a way for mankind to choose himself, to choose Jesus. So as a loving mom or dad, or just as a loving mom or dad, a zealous mom or dad for their kids, God is zealous for us. Don't bow down to other gods. First of all, they don't exist. Don't serve other gods. Serving what? You're serving a piece of wood or a piece of stone? He's zealous for us. For you, for me. And he's got to discipline us. If we knew him, if we followed him, and then we actually turn from him to bow down, to serve, to change our worldview from the worldview of the Bible... God's worldview to the worldview to that which is of a lie, it's got to be stopped. You know, of course, with the Lord, it's not going to be a slap on the wrist. And then we come to a very interesting statement here in verse 5. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children on the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. Now, the one thing I want you to remember, this is only related to idolatry. It is not related to sin in general. We've got to keep these words in context. Where did this come from? Go back in verse 3. You shall have no other gods before me. You're not going to make for yourself an idol or a likeness, etc., etc. And if you do this, what's going to happen since I'm a zealous God, and I'm zealous for you, and I'm going to have to discipline you. For he is God that's visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me. So this is all related to the sin of idolatry. Now, there's a number of questions that immediately arise as we read this. So if a man commits idolatry, will God punish his children, the second generation, and his grandchildren, the third generation, and his great-grandchildren, the fourth generation? Now, in the ESV study Bible, I find it interesting because the scholars say or imply that this is for any sin, not idolatry. This is for any sin. And they say always a sin by the fathers always has a negative effect on the next generations. Now that's that's an interesting view and it's a very interesting opinion. But the ESV is taking this phrase out of context and taking it away from the sin of idolatry. Now another question that we have is if indeed that God is going to punish the second, third, and fourth generations Does that mean the fifth generations are scot-free? What's going on here? Now, another question I pose, a theoretical. What if among the great-grandchildren, the fourth generation, suppose there's a number of great-grandchildren and one of them turns back to God, turns back to Yahweh. Does that one escape? So in other words, God will not punish that one, but will punish the other seven? Again, the ESV study Bible says, yeah, that's how you escape this, because God is going to punish the second and the third and the fourth generation. And the only way they can escape that is repenting. But that's very interesting, because the Bible does not say this. It's as if the ESV Bible study scholars are taking this and relating it to all sin. But here, it's like John Kareed in his 
Torah commentary. You've heard me use his name before. He is one of my staunch resources. He is a highly credible theologian, uh, Egyptologist, archaeologist, one of the lead scholars on the new archaeological study Bible from Crossway. And he talks about the fact that what we're dealing with is, is verse 5 is dealing with, in context, the sin of idolatry. And here we have the ESV study Bible. Bless them. Bless those scholars. But they're saying this relates to all types of sin. And I disagree. So when we take a look at the very words of God, let's just take a look at what God says about this situation. We go to Deuteronomy 24, verse 16, and we read, Fathers shall not be put to death for their sons, nor shall sons be put to death for their fathers. Everyone shall be put to death for his own sin. Interesting. Then we go to Jeremiah 31, verses 29 through 30. In those days they will not say again, the fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. But everyone will die for his own iniquity. Each man who eats the sour grapes, his teeth will be set on edge. On edge. Or we can go to Ezekiel, chapter 18, and we take a look at verses 1 through 4. Then the Lord, then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, What do you mean by using this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying, The fathers eat the sour grapes, but the children's teeth are set on edge? As I live, declares the Lord God, you, shall, you are surely not going to use this proverb in Israel anymore. Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. The soul who sins, the soul who sins will die. And in the same chapter in verse 20, the person who sins will die. The Son will not bear the punishment for the Father's iniquity, nor will the Father bear the punishment for the Son's iniquity. The righteousness of the righteous will be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked will be upon himself. So when we go back to chapter 20, verse 5, it, it doesn't it, it can't mean God punishes idolatry to one's children, grandchildren, and great grandchildren. It, it seems to contradict God's very own words. We read that God will visit the iniquity. Visit the word is pachad. Strong's number H6485. Pachad, visit, oh yeah. But if we take a look at the Gesenius Hebrew lexicon, it really means to strike upon or to strike against. Now, the reason why I bring this up, if we take a look at verse 5, visiting the iniquity, if we take a look at the Gesenius lexicon, it's to strike against not only the father, but the children, all the way to the third and fourth generations but here's the phrase, of them that hate me. This is the key phrase. God will strike upon the iniquity of the father on the children to the third and fourth generation of those that hate me or them that hate me. You guys, the pronoun in Hebrew exists. In other words, God giving these words, inspiring Moses to write these words. We've got that pronoun them and means that indeed all of these people, the father, his children, his great his grandchildren, his great grandchildren are all enemies of God. So God is saying if this idolatry continues on into the second, third and fourth generation, all the children who were influenced by that idolatry and practice it, they're going to be punished. So as that idolatry from the Father carries down from one generation to another, it becomes a family worldview. And I think what may be going on here, what may be going, it's just, again, I think, is that a father has a tremendous influence on his children. 
and then those children on their children so god seems to be saying that these four generations will be struck but they're all god's enemies because again god says of those who hate me so in other words there's a grandchild out there and he realizes god is now going to punish his family and he said hey i learned this from my dad it's not my fault but with god seemingly we don't get off the hook so god seems to be saying he's going to severely strike many who hate him many who do idolatry he's going to strike them he's going to strike the father and all those in the family that have fallen under his influence but with all this let me say this checking one source after another jewish sources and christian sources what i find on this verse or this phrase in verse 5 visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children on the third and fourth generations of those who hate me there's no agreement it, it seems as every jewish scholar and every christian scholar has a different position all have different unique views of this concept of visiting the iniquity seemingly you guys what we have is another one of those instances where the torah the lord is not giving us a clear understanding to them in 1446 bc 50 days after they left passover this is what's going on here you guys they're getting this 50 days after they left or 50 days since they've had their passover meal so it seems as if they got it then and for us it seems like we're all over the map now here when i go to Chumash, the orthodox rabbinic commentary specifically on this verse i think they make a good point listen to this the sin of the fathers upon children in response to the question of how children can be punished for the sins they did not commit the rabbis explained that children are punished only only if they carry on the sinful legacy of their parents or if it was in their power to protest but they acquiesced to the lifestyle that was shown them thus ratifying the deeds of their parents and adopting them as their own the rabbinic opinion makes sense so to despite the confusion on this despite the lack of agreement one of the things that seemingly we can agree on is idolatry is a big deal he's going to strike in an entire family an entire community nations that are his enemies as he goes beyond the individual it goes beyond one man's sin this the idolatry is huge in god's eyes this is one thing that we can cl conclude here it goes beyond one man's sin especially if the generations after him and follow him in his footsteps. And then we come to verse 6. Chapter 20, Exodus 20, verse 6. But showing loving kindness to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. And it's very interesting. His mercy is boundless. The Hebrew word there is chesed, H2617. It means mercy, it means loving kindness, and in the Hebrew, in the, in the Gesenius Hebrew lexicon, it can mean grace. In actuality, in the Hebrew, when we read, read, read verse 6, we can say, but showing grace to thousands? No, showing grace to a thousand generations. That's exactly what it says in Hebrew. Showing grace to a thousand generations. You guys, the Bible assumes a generation is 40 years. So a thousand generations is 40,000 years. Humankind has not been on this planet for 40,000 years. It's like as God is saying, it's all history. I want to end with Psalm 100. And in Psalm 100, we read, Shout joyfully 
to the Lord all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful singing. Know that the Lord himself is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His loving kindness has chesed. His grace is everlasting. And his faithfulness to all generations, a thousand generations, 40,000 years. And God shows us his chesed, his grace that will last forever in his son, Jesus. And so we will continue, and I will see you in lesson number seven. And until then, Yevrekenu Adonai Vesha Markenu, Yair Adonai Panavelenu, Vekunekenu, Isa Adonai Panavelenu, Viasemlanu Shalom, Beyeshua Adonenu. May the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord's face shine upon us and be gracious to us. May he lift up his eyes upon us. And may he give us his shalom in Jesus, our Lord.